Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place Path Train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger. This week on NJ Business Beat, New Jersey's path forward following the election night drama. Business leaders weigh in on the tight gubernatorial race and Governor Murphy's win. Plus, new federal rules for private businesses. The Biden administration details its nationwide vaccine mandate for companies. And we put the job market in focus, looking at how New Jersey's workforce is changing from companies no longer demanding college degree requirements to workers using their newfound leverage to find better jobs. That's straight ahead on NJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining us on NJ Business Beat. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. New Jersey is going to keep moving forward. That was the pledge made by Governor Phil Murphy, who secured a second term in this week's elections by a razor thin margin. At the time of this writing, with 99% of precincts reporting, Murphy won just over 50% of the vote, about one percentage point more than his Republican challenger, Jack Cittarelli. Most of New Jersey didn't even bother to cast ballots. An analysis by the Associated Press the day after Election Day found only 37% of eligible residents voted. Now that number could increase as more mail-in ballots are counted, but it still marks historically low voter turnout. Pollsters and pundits were offering all sorts of reasons why the governor's race was so close. Business leaders believe dissatisfaction over the business climate, the economy, and taxes influenced the vote. I spoke with two of those leaders, Tom Bracken, the president and CEO of the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, and an NJPBS board of trustee, as well as Michelle Sikirka, the president and CEO of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. You know, the governor has had, a, had a, has been diverted with COVID, no question. We understand that. But I think there still could have been a little more balance between uh, handling the economic crisis and the medical crisis. Uh, but uh, when you, you have so many businesses that have closed, so many restaurants that have closed, so many people out of work, companies struggling to recover, I think definitely that plays a role. I just think, you know, from the business perspective, business absolutely feels, you know, taken advantage of. As you know, New Jersey was shut down the longest in the entire nation. Definitions of essential and non-essential that impacted businesses for months and months and months. You know, business is just hanging on right now, Rhonda. The business of sports betting has been doing very well in New Jersey, but it was dealt an election day setback. A ballot question asked whether sports betting should be expanded in the state to include all college sporting events, including those involving New Jersey teams. Voters nixed the idea, with most of the precincts reporting more than 57% voted against the question and only 43% voted yes. Millions of workers must be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 by January 4th or undergo weekly tests for COVID exposure under new rules from the Biden administration. In September, President Biden mandated vaccinations for workers of private companies with more than 100 employees, but details on how this would work were just released this past week. According to the new rules, unvaccinated workers must start wearing masks by December 5th and provide negative COVID tests each week ahead of that January 4th date. Anyone who tests positive cannot go to work. New Jersey's burgeoning wind industry is attracting attention outside of the state. Six of the world's biggest offshore wind developers and turbine manufacturers are vying to become tenants at New Jersey's wind port in South Jersey. We got a progress report on this from Tim Sullivan, the CEO of the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. 
Tim, there's been some key developments on the wind port in South Jersey in recent weeks, including the fact that six companies are showing interest. Tell me about these bids that have been received and what happens next? We got uh, about a week and a half ago, an extraordinary response to a bid process for tenants at the wind port. There's two kind of parts of that process. One is for manufacturers and one is for offshore wind companies that are gonna own and operate kind of the power plants out at sea. Uh, on the manufacturing side, the top three global firms, uh, GE, Vestas, and Siemens, all want to be a part of this wind port. And on the uh, developer side, on the, on the wind company side, uh, three companies, Orsted, Atlantic Shores, and Equinor, uh, all want to be part of this uh, uh, wind port. So we think the potential here is extraordinary. So what happens next now that the bids are in? What's the process from here? We're going to begin once we just we have a little bit more uh, you know reviewing of what's come through and, and making sure we have everything um, sort of ticked and tied from a, a, a process perspective. But then we're going to start negotiations with all six of those parties, uh, and we're going to work to drive a great deal uh, for for the taxpayers in New Jersey, for the people in New Jersey. That 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 deal uh, will sort of pivot on how many jobs are they willing to are going to create, what's the level of capital they're willing to invest, uh, what. Price are they willing to pay for the land that they're going to be leasing from the state, from the EDA? Uh, and so we think um, we've got a tremendous amount of uh, momentum here, and that's a really good thing for the, the build out and the development of this port that really, I think, underscores uh, the, the intelligence of Governor Murphy's strategy around offshore wind. This is really strong validation from the private sector uh, that this is an extraordinary uh, piece of infrastructure that Governor Murphy's building uh, here in South Jersey. So bring us up to date on the timeline, especially as you review these bids. Are we still on track in terms of uh, the start of work at the Windport? And also, if you could bring us up to speed on when we'll actually see some of these jobs come to fruition. Yeah, the exciting news, Rhonda, is that work is happening at the Windport right now. There, are, there's, uh, there's site works and earthworks happening at the Windport right now. The governor uh, and the Senate president and Chairman Bercelli and the labor, U.S. Labor Secretary were in, uh, in, in uh, Lower Alloys Creek back in early September to begin work and uh, do the, the groundbreaking for this project. So that work is underway. Uh, Full scale construction will probably start very late this year, early part of next year. Uh, and then so there'll, there'll be you know real jobs right now because of offshore wind uh, are already happening. And then the manufacturing jobs are probably a year or two away, depending on the proposals and the um, uh, the nature of the, the construction for the, the facilities that the, these uh, firms are going to want to build. But the good news is, and, and we're making investments in uh, the workforce development to get folks ready for those jobs. Now, these are these are new industries. They're, they're similar to existing industries. So in the building trades, there's lots of great experience uh, in various different trades and how to build and install and operate these kinds of facilities. But on the manufacturing side, um, there's apprenticeship programs that are being stood up. There's um, uh, great partnerships with the community college network, particularly in South Jersey, uh, and, and the, and the higher, broader higher education network to get folks uh, an opportunity to get into this career path uh, today. And those are investments that people should be making uh, in themselves in that training now, because these jobs are coming. This is no longer sort of out over the horizon. Maybe it's going to happen someday. This, this is very real, and it's, uh, it's becoming very uh, near term. Tim Sullivan, thanks for your time. All right, great to be with you, Rana. New Jersey companies are making some strides when it comes to increasing diversity. A new report called A Seat at the Table from Executive Women of New Jersey shows women are now better represented on company boards. In 2019, 18% of the board seats at Garden State companies were held by women, up from just 14% in 2013. And the number of companies without any women on their boards decreased to just 16% down from 30%. We spoke to the president of Executive Women of New Jersey, Anna Maria Tejeda. Your report shows progress in some areas and in other areas where we're still in need of more progress. What's your bird's eye view of some of the findings? Our perspective is that this is a good starter. Um, this report is a good started to have a conversation about really diversifying corporate boards when it comes to racial diversity in addition to gender diversity. So why do you think the progress has been made on the gender diversity front? Well, there's been an active, I think, advocacy for, I would say, for the past 20 years or so to really advocate for gender diversity on corporate boards. Um, even uh, public documents referencing companies show, you know, women on corporate boards, right? You can see the data on that. When it comes to racial diversity, corporations are not obligated to show um, their racial or, or ethnic diversity. And so I think that's part of it. Um, and also, as you know, Rhonda, with the last year with the pandemic, 
with the racial reckoning that has happened in this country, I think this has become more of an issue to really press corporations to have uh, diverse corporate boards that are more representative of their client base, of their customer base. How can you help boards achieve this goal? I mean, certainly you look around at a place like New Jersey, which is such a diverse state, it seems to me that we should be able to catch up on this area. We focus on a number of corporations that we have highlighted in the past that have three or more women on their boards um, and also have a diverse board, right? And we have asked them and, and basically done a case analysis as to what they've done that's been uh, working for them, right? And the one thing that we've noticed and, and that you'll see when you are, uh, read the report is that because they have a diverse board, they are able to get um, more diverse corporate board directors. And so give me some examples of those recommendations. So the, the main thing is corporations have to think differently. I think a lot of corporations have focused on populating the corporate boards with traditional roles, such as C-suite members, CFO, CEOs. The, the numbers show that you don't have a lot of people of color in these positions, right? So you have to think outside the box. We always hear that corporations say there's not enough people of color in the pipeline. Well, corporations really have to take an active effort to create that pipeline. And the reality is, is that you do have um, individuals in the pipeline who are, who are in functional roles, who are in positions such as, um, you know, human resources um, department that lead those departments. Um, and as you know, Rhonda, employees are the key aspect of corporations. And so why not uh, look to these type of leaders to bring them up um, within the C-suite as well as in the corporation. So that's one. The second one is you have to be intentional about diversifying um, your board and it has to be an ongoing process. You have to have accountability. So not only do you have to think differently, not only do you have to be intentional, but you also have to make sure you're counting how you're changing the diversity. Do you feel confident the next time that you do this report, you will see the numbers move? I really do think because of what has happened in this country in the past year and a half, um, you really want to be able to maximize on this social movement. And I think corporations um, are really, um, you know, they're really taking this on seriously. And finally, how does New Jersey's corporations, how do they fare compared to what we see nationally? So New Jersey corporations aren't doing that much better um, than the uh, national uh, corporations when it comes to racial diversity. Um, and even it's uh, kind of the same when you're dealing with uh, gender diversity. And so we do hope that because we are in a state that's much more diverse, because you have so much talent in the state, it will not be um, a hard burden for corporations to really diversify their corporate boards. Great talking to you on this very important subject. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Rhonda. The push toward diversity is just one issue occupying companies. Many are also trying to rebuild their workforces at a time when employees are hard to find or are quitting to pursue something else. So companies are broadening their search for workers and employees are finding they have more bargaining power. We're putting these changing labor market trends in focus this week. New Jersey-based ADP says hiring picked up in October as the Delta wave of the COVID-19 pandemic winds down. 571,000 new jobs were added to the economy last month, with large companies doing most of the hiring. And ADP is predicting big job gains in the months ahead. ADP also took a closer look at labor market trends over a three-month period ending in September. Employment growth was up more than 4% in the quarter. Worker wages increased by 3.3%. For those who have left their jobs for greener pastures, pay increases were even higher. Job switchers saw their wages increase by 6.6%. Workers in the trade, transportation, and utilities sector got the biggest pay raises with a gain of 6.7%. In this tight job market, we're seeing companies become more proactive about expanding their talent pool, and that includes recruiting employees without college degrees. Businesses are turning to apprenticeship and training programs to develop a pipeline of workers who don't need four-year degrees. We caught up with a company called Multiverse, which works with employee-starved businesses to develop apprenticeship programs in areas like data and software engineering. Multiverse works with over 300 businesses globally and a growing number in the U.S., including some big names like Google. 
I spoke with Sophie Ruddock, who's the VP of North America for the company. Sophie, your company really is fulfilling a need, not just uh, internationally, but here in the US. What were you seeing in the US market that made you decide the opportunity was ripe to come into the United States to help? Multiverse as an organization is focused on building this outstanding alternative to college and corporate training, one that focuses on skills, access, equity, and solving these critical challenges for businesses. And we see professional apprenticeships, full-time employment that is free to the individual, that is coupled with real experience and on-the-job training as the key to solving these challenges. How does it work? Do the U.S. companies contact you and you come in and set up a program for them? Um, a large majority of Fortune 1000 companies, as well as fast-growing small and medium-sized businesses, have all started to acknowledge that they want to do something differently. And in doing so, that means finding a new talent pipeline and a way of training these individuals up on the job. And so we'll come to them or they'll come to us and work with them to really think how an apprenticeship program can solve some of their key business challenges. People have heard for quite some time that if you go to college, you have the ability to make a higher salary. Is that being turned on its head right now? It's completely being turned on its head. I think the average salary for a college graduate right now is around $50,000. And that doesn't take into account the sometimes up to hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt that someone takes on. We see our apprentices, their starting salary be between fifty dollars and $70,000. And that's when they start at the ages of 18 to 24 without a four-year college degree. And then we see sort of upon completing over 90% of them take on new roles within their companies, have pay rises or have increased um, responsibilities. So we're seeing not only you're not taking on debt, but actually that path to progression is that much quicker when you go down these new routes. And you mentioned diversity at the beginning of our conversation together. How is this helping to solve diversity challenges in the workplace? So we really believe in widening the gate, but not lowering the bar. We are not saying to businesses that they should compromise on quality. But what we are saying is that there are incredible um, individuals that you wouldn't be meeting because degree requirements are screening out two thirds of black Americans and three quarters of Hispanic Americans. So we find high potential individuals um, by partnering with communities, partnering with schools, partnering with colleges, having very creative marketing campaigns through TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat, um, and then really assessing for potential. So we look at assessing for grit, not grades. So that we're able to find a really high potential talent pipeline for our employers. And then once they're on the roll, with them with them for the next 18 months, training them up in hard, soft, and durable skills. And what I mean by that is the hard skills are the technical skills that every employer is craving. And the durable skills are the skills that really differentiate our apprentices and really what makes someone successful. And those are leadership, managing up, communication, negotiation. And um, it's really that that helps our apprentices to then progress in the workplace once they're in. Sophie, it's been great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Find out more about apprenticeship programs. I talked with Andrew Cascino. He left college for hands-on training at the offices of Chubb in Jersey City. Andrew, tell me about yourself. How did you find your way into an apprenticeship program? Uh, I found my way into the apprenticeship program through uh, another program I was doing that I had a mentor. And through there, after graduating it, I was given opportunity uh, to go to Multiverse. And through Multiverse, uh, I found Chubb. And it wasn't particularly the field I was studying prior. Um, I was more in cybersecurity, uh, trying to be like a network analyst. But instead, uh, this was geared towards a data analyst, part of the Internet of Things team at Chubb. So I went for it because uh, opportunity like that doesn't really come to anyone that's not in college. And um, I just jumped for it and it's been a great experience. What was your educational background before moving into apprenticeship? Uh, well, it was, uh, I was two years into college. So I was in, uh, a sophomore at uh, John Jay uh, and I was majoring in uh, cybersecurity and uh, informational technology. And through financial reasons, I wasn't able to continue but I still wanted to pursue my dream uh, in the technology space. So I kept looking and 
I just came across these programs that led me to uh, Multiverse. And how long will your training last at Multiverse? When do you anticipate getting out there in the workforce? Uh, well, it's going to last until March. Uh, so it's like a full year. Uh, so that's really good to put on your resume. And what I'm going to do afterwards is uh, I'm going to seek um, all the connections I made at Chubb and Multiverse and see where that could lead me. At this point, you've decided that you don't really need college, that you can pursue another avenue. Why did it make sense to you? Uh, it made sense to me because I'm, uh, I'm a person that's more hands-on. So I really wanted to just get into the field and get dirty. And uh, in my mind, what corporate America was through like TV and movies is this like really stressful, uh, hardworking and really like cutthroat type of uh, field. Um, but it's really not. Um, it's actually just um, working at Chubb has been really nice. And everyone's super helpful looking out for you there's also opportunities to learn more while working at the job through online learning um so it it is really nice to be part of this uh, company what's your ambition not just only when you finish up this program and start your first job what's your ultimate career ambition um my ultimate career ambition uh, is to not only be a data analyst, but my hopes and dreams is to be part of uh, a video game studio and working towards what helped me as a kid, inspire me to keep going and and look, you know, uh, uh, to to the stars. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, definitely that uh, being part of the video game industry. Well, good luck to you. Thanks for uh, sharing your story with me. Thank you. And thank you for your time. If you're doing the nine to five grind or toiling in the gig economy, here's something to think about. You have a lot more say in your career than you've had in the past. That might explain why millions of people have been quitting their jobs. Why stay if you're not happy? The worker shortage has shifted the balance of power between employer and employee. We spoke with Jane Oates, the president of Working Nation, about that. Jane, we have seen economists really raising their eyebrows about this labor market. There is so much going on, including the fact that millions of people are, are walking away from their jobs. What's it going to take to get employees to go back to their offices and workplaces? Workers want to feel safe. You know, they want to make sure that their workplace is safe and they're not putting themselves or their families at risk. And I think that is job number one for employers to, to convey, to communicate to prospective employers as well as incumbent workers that they're following safety protocols every day. And then I think we get to the other elements that, you know, workers have cared about forever and that's wages and flexibility. The other new one I think that we're learning more about every day is more than ever, employees want to know that employers will invest in them. When you say invest in them, what do you mean by that? So I think it's respect them. And, you know, for years, states like New Jersey and, you know, I grew up, you can tell from my accent in Philadelphia, Organized labor really took care of that for many employees. You know, they made sure they negotiated at the table, the safety that I was talking about before, but all the, also the continuous learning, the learning that not only prepares you to do your current job better, but may put you on a career trajectory that takes you to a new job that pays more and has a better title. So when I go back to that, you know, we've lost so many union jobs. So now employers have to figure out how to do that through their HR people. How does an HR uh, representative say to a prospective employee, we invest in you? I think one thing that's interesting that you mentioned before was that wages are more of an issue and we are seeing wages increase rather significantly. The problem is so is inflation. So even though a company might think they're handing out nice raises, the employee's not really feeling that. You know, I think what people have lost perspective on is that it costs money to go to work. When you and I go to work every day, whether we drive or whether we take public transportation, 
how we dress costs us more, having your hair cut costs more. It, there is a cost to going to work. And I think you're right. It, wages have gone up in some sectors as much as 10% over the last year. But you know, we also forget that wages were stagnant for nearly a decade for most people. So that really is like a market correction, I think, you also talked about flexibility. In some ways, are workers right now in the driver's seat? Because we are seeing some companies say, you can work from home a couple of days a week if that's what you want to do. There are more job openings and there are bodies to fill them. So is this kind of the moment for workers to speak up? We have gone through a vacuum, I would say a 20 year at least vacuum where workers have lost their voice and, you know, uh, employers have been able to even even the greatest employers have been able to get away with a one size fits all. And that's just not true. I mean, employees are unique individuals. Jane, it's been great catching up with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Always great talking to you. And that wraps up our show for this week. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Rhonda Schaffler. We'll see you next week. Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place PATH train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger.